My name's Merlin Crossley. I'm the DVC academic here, and it's a great pleasure to open the proceedings. This is our first uh, Saint Education Academy lecture for 2018. Uh, I absolutely love these lectures. It's terrific to get com a community of people together, people who care passionately about education, but also people who have very well-formed ideas, individual ideas, and we learn from each other, and we challenge them. Uh, Alex Steele, uh, I first met on the academic board, was when I first came across it. Alex was making a very strong case for reform of law admissions. And I was very impressed by the calm, logical, relentless argument. <laughs> and, uh, and I've enjoyed working with Alex on, we've just, we're both on the University Academic Quality Committee. Uh, I've learned a lot. What always happens is Alex will make an argument and often I'll think about it, but it'll be the next day that I realise that it was actually correct. <laughs> uh, and, and I do actually, I very much like uh, uh, the exchanges that I've had with Alex and his colleagues in the Faculty of Law. I looked at the, when I saw Alex's uh, uh, abstract for this, I immediately uh, emailed him and said, gosh, I can't agree with any of that. And uh, he emailed me back and said something like, Oh, well, you'll have to wait and see. You know, he just didn't answer. But I did think I had to give a quote because I saw the title, which I like very much. I mean, that doesn't look so much hard as hard and dangerous. I hope our teaching is as dangerous as that. But I was rem reminded of this quote. You'll know it came, it came when America was led by um, people of some stature. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon uh, in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organise and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is that one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. It's quite good. I think all our committees should set themselves hard challenges <laughs> like that as well. But enough of that administrative talk. No, it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Alex, and I look forward to the talk and the discussion afterwards. Jeff Crisp, uh, PVC Education, will lead that. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, yes, it's um, uh, enormous pleasure to be here and, and privilege. And I, I should, of course, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the um, Bidjigal people, um, and um, pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I, and I also wanted to start by um, acknowledging the, um, the enormous work and effort that goes into teaching and into learning um, at this university. I mean, we have an enormous group of um, fantastically dedicated teachers and fantastically dedicated students. Um, I'm going to use the word teaching in this talk, even though I don't actually believe that's what we should be doing. Um, we're sort of facilitating learning, but teaching is just a shorthand that's so hard to get away from. The other thing I should do is um, admit that um, this was, of course, completely bait advertising. This isn't what I'm talking about at all. Um, what I really wanted to talk about was the way in which the best learning occurs when we challenge ourselves um, and that the best teaching is also challenging for the teacher. If a teacher isn't feeling challenged when they're teaching, they're probably not teaching to the level they could be at. Um, there's also a, a, a whole lot of things I have to do first, you know, as a lawyer, to create caveats in position and avoid liability for things. Um, the first thing is that there's a huge amount of challenges that, that students and staff face which are outside of the learning environment um, or maybe part of the learning environment but that I can't talk about today. But um, I think in lots of cases, or in some cases, these need to be addressed first. So we can't sort of charge on without addressing um, disadvantage. We can't charge on without um, taking into account uh, well-being and things like that. But often a lot of these things are actually um, not linked to learning. So th there are positive correlations between giving people achievable challenges and addressing issues of, of well-being. So I'm, I'm going to be in a bit of a bubble here and I'm going to ignore those issues, but uh, that's just a time constraint. Um, 
And the other really important thing is, of course, that staff well-being being is absolutely vital to good teaching. And you cannot ask teachers to do more unless, of course, they're able to do more and they're supported to do more. So again, that's something I can't address, but is, is implicit in what I'm saying. And the other thing I want to do is I want to have a bit of a go at technology, but w the digital revolution has happened. Uh, we are never going back. Um, and so I'm not really sort of arguing that technology is a bad thing. But being a lawyer, I'm looking at the fringes and I'm saying there are, there are issues that we, may, we probably need to think about as we go forward with, with the digital um, uplift. Um, and the other thing is that approaches to teaching and learning should, wherever possible, be evidence-based. And to prove a point, um, you've all got um, a partial bibliography in which I'm attempting to make sure that every single thing I say in this lecture tonight has a reference. Um, I'll leave you to work it out if you're crazy enough to work out where they're all coming from. And it's a partial bibliography too, because it, it's a product of two things. One, I really don't know much of what I'm talking about, so a lot of this is quite random. And the second thing is, of course, I use Google. So there are lots of other references out there, and I mean, there are lots of ones I know about that I didn't put in because I hit two pages and I had to stop. Um, and it's also another point about the, the, the advantages and dangers of technology that I did all of that through Zotero. So I just, just searching through Google Scholar, finding the ones I liked, clicking on them, dropping them down into a bibliography and printing them. So that's an idea of what your students can do if they're tax heavy. Um, all right, so uh, what are the forms of hard in learning and teaching? There's heaps of them and every time I uh, somebody um, mentioned this talk to me, they all gave me a different understanding of what they thought the talk was about. Um, and sadly, nobody guessed what I was actually talking about, so you'll all probably be slightly disappointed. The five that I thought of as, as big challenges for, for education at the moment are that big one of challenges to actually what is the point of universities and why are students coming here. Um, the intellectual challenges that we face uh, as teachers and uh, in terms of keeping up with, with research and our students in terms of, of learning, but I'm not going to talk about either of those. What I'm going to sort of talk about um, are the challenges that students face in relation to their ability um, and how to stretch that, challenges in terms of student worldviews wor and the emotional challenges that students face as part of the affect of learning. And I'm also going to look at the same time at how that is challenging for teachers and why it should be challenging in the way in which we teach. So first of all, um, challenges to ability. Um, if I could put a far side slide for every slide I would, but I've, I've limited myself to two. Um, when we're looking at abilities for students, I think there are lots of things that students do really, really well, and we, um, we tend to encourage them along those tracks in terms of the things they do well. But there are some things that I think, and I'm, being, I'm generalizing here, I think there are some things that this generation of students find harder to do than previous generations, and it has a lot to do with technology. Um, the first one is extended concentration on single tasks for long periods of time. I mean, um, they are amazing multitaskers, uh, far better than, than I will ever be. Um, but getting someone to stop and only think about one thing, like actually be in a class and listen to the conversation rather than checking Facebook and the latest sort of share sales or whatever it is they're doing as well, or fashion or whatever, I mean, it's hard. It's very hard for them to be still and to concentrate on one thing. Um, and coming with that is reading complex text. Everybody can read um, stuff off their phone. They read lots and lots of stuff um, that comes through Facebook, but give them uh, a book with no pictures that's more than 50 pages long, and there is an issue. And it's not, it's not their fault. It's not the student's fault. It's the, it's the environment that they're in. Um, and linked to that is their ability to, to write more than a page or two and continue an argument through. Because again, it's so quickly moving from one thing to the other. And there's an argument which we really don't have I don't have time in this talk to, to think about is, What's the point of that and why do we need that and why does business not quite realise why it needs it? Okay, so technology is great for engagement. We know that it, makes, it wakes us all up. That's why I'm using PowerPoint rather than sitting in a dark hall reading my notes. Um, but can it build ability? And obviously it can, right? So, but I'm just going to raise a couple of little um, issues. So these are quotes from, a, from an article by Greenfield, which is in, in the bibliography, and she's coming from a, a science perspective. So the first thing she says is that real-time audio-visual mediums don't, and this is all based on research, there is no reflection in real-time audio-visual uh, audio mediums. A book automatically gives you the space to stop, because if you don't understand the word, you read it again, you go forwards and backwards, you can go exactly back to the word you want to go back to instantly. Whereas if you're trying to do it with video or, you know, depending on what that, 
the, the line is like and whether you can get your cursor onto the thing. So, you know, there, there are real issues with stopping, pausing, being in the moment and reflecting with, with video. So video is fantastic for projecting a message, but it may not be the best way to get someone to think about something. Um, reading is also linked to critical thinking. I mean, we've known this for years, and so therefore, if our students are coming to university having done less reading than previous generations, we can sort of assume that they've actually done less critical thinking in that traditional form. They may have done a lot of interactive critical thinking using technology, but the traditional understanding that we have, maybe they may need a bit of help with. And the other thing that's really interesting is that audiovisual um, inhibits imaginative responses. Okay, so. Um, the longer quote there points out that um, you can easily recall things, but you can't necessarily um, uh, be imaginative. And the simplest way to explain that is, um, Frodo, uh, no, Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit is Martin Freeman. Once you've seen that film, you cannot imagine him as anybody else. Any book that you've read and then you've seen a film, suddenly it's frozen. So if you give students video, they will, they will be frozen into that image that you've given them. So what are you looking at? What's the first thing you look at there? It's not that boring definition, is it? It's the guy with the moving jelly. And then you think, I've looked at that five times now, because it's on repeat. Maybe I should, I'll look at the cute girl. Ah, oh, and now I look at this, and eventually, what is that really boring piece of text? So that's the message you send to students when you put audio visual things, and you mix them together. So if you want the students to get a piece of written information, don't put a video next to it. So video will distract. I mean, what's really interesting here is the video shows you the, the, the physical properties of the jelly, which none of the others actually show you. The girl shows you and, and sort of frames for you the idea that this is a non-toxic, fun substance. It's not dangerous, because clearly a, a young girl would not be smiling with it all over her hands if it was dangerous. So they are sending you messages. The, the picture gives you a color and a shape, but it gives you nothing else about it. You don't know how solid it is or how hard. The definition, and of course I'm a lawyer, so the only thing I can really cope with are words, the definition gives you the history of it, how it's made, what its ingredients are, and its, um, uh, and its predictable properties. So it doesn't actually, doesn't show you a jelly, but it gives you all the information about its history, content, and future, which allows you to imagine what jellies might be, other than the one you've just seen. So, so video does fantastic things for engagement. It really shows you things. It gets things that would otherwise need to be explained. But there's something about words that produces imagination and predictability, which, which video doesn't always do. So video is fantastic. Pictures are fantastic. But also, words are fantastic. So you, you need to work out what you're trying to do in any one situation. So reading online. Everyone does it now. Um, and there's lots of studies showing that, it's, that it has sort of some negative effects. This is one of the most recent ones I've found. And what's interesting about this is it's um, a study of university students. And instead of asking them to read short things, it was asking them to read um, extracts from a textbook and newspaper articles. And the results were the students much preferred to use the digital text, and they thought they understood it just as much as they did the, the written, uh, the printed text. But the actual results were that while both mediums, you remember the main ideas, it's really only with the printed version, the physical version, that you actually remember the detail. And there's an interesting implication in that in the terms of what we do with online learning. So if we want people to get big ideas quickly, online's the way to go. If we want them to actually think and get detail, we need to tell them to print it out sit down in a quiet corner with a highlighter and, and think it through. So there are, and these of course are variant. I mean obviously um, it's, it's, we're talking about degrees. We're not talking about the fact that if you read online you don't understand it. You will, but it will be harder because the natural tendency is to get detail more in, in the printed word. Um, and then we have Google Brain. And this article, um, the 2016 one, is, is a wonderful meta-analysis of neuro, um, neuroscience into the brain and how the brain is changing. And there's a whole lot of sort of popular stuff out there about how terrible it is and um, one way or the other. But this one's actually a neuroscience one. And the interesting thing about it is they're basically saying that we're shifting from a process of having to always remember things to a process of, uh, to a situation where we rely on um, memory as an external memory bank. So we don't remember anything anymore, we just remember where we saw it. 
And once we lose the memory of where we saw it, we've lost it. So, so our, our, it, in terms of a, a learning and teaching scenario, you've got students who will be able to find things easily. So open book exams um, with the internet are fantastic. They can find everything. Give them a closed book exam and you're forcing them to actually do something they're not used to doing. So there are, you know, and that might be a good or a bad thing depending on which side of the fence you're on. But we need to realise that people just don't memorise and internalise memory in the way in which previous generations did. Okay, read this. The only thing I want to tell you is it was written by a 23 year old. And if you know who wrote it, don't tell anyone. Isn't the silence awkward? Um, I mean, that's part of the point, isn't it? Silence in a, in a sort of a situation like this is unusual and strange, and that prompts your brain to think, hang on, what's going on? What am I doing? Should I have read that a bit slower? What, is everybody still reading it? What's going on? Right, so, so that unexpected um, difficulty of being in an awkward situation is, is, um, is part of what's going on. Now, this is a parlor trick. Um, and there's a lot of really good psychological research that I'm sort of trashing as I do this. But um, this is a sort of a, a collection of, of examples about, about learning. The first thing is framing. So what you tell somebody about information before they get it has a massive impact on the way they read it. So I told you that was written by a 23-year-old and it has that strange line about I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. Now probably some of you know this fabulous um, person who wrote this. But I could have told you it was a 23 year old, which is true. I could have told you also it was the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, which would have been a very different way of looking at it. I could have told you it was written by, um, it was a piece of poetry, or I could have told you it was a rock and roll song, or I could have told you it was Bob Dylan. Now all of those are true, but all of them give you incredibly different ways of looking at that. So if I say that's a Bob Dylan lyric, what do you think? Then your, your understanding of Bob Dylan it makes a huge difference and you think of him as an old man now, but if I tell you he wrote that at the age of 23 and then I tell you that that's, that's his most obscure song and that's his song where he is saying I don't want to be the god of the, sort of the folk generation anymore, I just want to, you know, I don't believe it's as clear as it was and I want out. Um, that changes, so framing makes a huge difference in terms of the way you, you interpret things. Second thing is the clarity of text. You notice that the instruction across the top was in really clear Arial font with lots of white around it, and it told you something, so you accepted that. And then beneath it was something that was written in really hard to understand text. So there is, there is an argument that the clearer the text is, and the more sort of white spaces and everything around it, it increases authority and you tend to believe it. So if you're going to create online materials for students and you're going to make it really clear and really easy to understand, they will accept it as truth. If you want them to be critical, don't do it that way. So, that, I mean, you know that. You remember your classes where you had the lecturer you couldn't stand because they gave you the really bad handouts. And they're a mess and you're constantly going, this guy's an idiot, I mean, this doesn't make sense. Because it, it, subconsciously your critical faculties were engaged. The other thing is this fabulous notion of disfluency, which is sort of gaining traction at the moment. And the idea is that your brain wants to quickly get to the answer. If you make it harder, you can actually engage um, concentration and critical thinking. Now the parlor trick version and the labo laboratory test versions use bad font. So they say if it's written in a bad font, they can show that um, readers actually take more time and think more about it just because it's harder. Um, but the, the more useful thing is about complex text. And we know this certainly when we're teaching law students. If you give them a, a really short extract, they'll get it and they'll move on. But if you give them a really long extract, they will complain about it and complain about it. But they will learn to read it. And once they've learned to read it, you can give them longer and longer things and have deeper and deeper conversations. So we need to be very careful in the way in which we teach people that we need to increase the complexity of the text because that increases the learning. Now, all of this is about setting the challenge at the right point 
for the student to be able to achieve it. So you wouldn't give first years incredibly long bits of text. Um, you, would, you would ease them into it, but the longer and more complex the text is, the more likely it is that they will slow down, concentrate, find a quiet place and think about it and, and get more sort of critical um, use out of it. Um, the other thing is, that the, um, is the testing effect. So the testing effect is, so that said there was a test afterwards. Well, there isn't. A bit, but because it says there is a test that will follow, at least some of you probably thought, oh, well, I'll read this carefully. Jeff didn't, but the rest of you did. Because um, he, was, he, he, he was cheating, he was looking up the answer. Um, which is uh, efficient. Um, but test, the testing effect says that as, I mean, this is about formative testing really. It's not really about big stakes, big large stakes testing. But if you are doing sort of short quizzes or you're actually asking somebody about what they read as they go through or the activity they did and what they found out about it, if you are requiring recall after doing it, that actually increases understanding and increases retention of knowledge. And there's an article in there about um, science graduates and how within, I think, three years they've forgotten more than half of anything they ever learnt at, at uni. So you have a serious problem of everybody forgetting everything they've learnt, but the more the little tests um, go through the learning process, the more things are retained. Um, the other thing I haven't put in there is the spacing effect too. So if you actually then space out the testing and you make people sleep in between their learning and their testing, that also increases learning. Um, and critical thinking, obviously something that's really important, open-ended stimulants. So that, that, that passage from Bob Dylan did not make clear sense. So it required you to actually work out what it meant and if we were going to have a discussion we would have got many opinions about what it meant and we would have all learnt a lot from each other about, uh, about perspectives and so forth. So the more open-ended things are, the more critical thinking is engaged. And there's also a study, which I think is um, in the bibliography as well, that the best effects for um, engaging critical thinking are uh, the first two are critical, the third one is sort of a bonus one. But it's dialogue, and it's dialogue in larger groups rather than smaller groups, so a whole classroom discussion where you hear other people's opinions and you, and you have to engage with it. Authentic instruction, so where you get people to talk about things that happen in the real world, solving real world problems, real world dilemmas. Those two together really enhance critical thinking. And mentorship does as well, but if you do it only one-to-one, -one, if the only thing you've got is mentorship, then interestingly, it doesn't increase critical thinking. So presumably, you either agree or disagree with your mentor, and that's the end of it. So you need multiple, multiple people. Um, and this is all about desirable difficulties, and, and, the, and the Bjorks are um, sort of the leaders um, in this field. And, and this is probably a, an important thing to say at this point, that before you go any further, it's about a desirable difficulty. Um, they're desirable because they trigger encoding and retrieval processes that support learning, comprehension and remembering, but if they don't have the background knowledge or the skills to respond to them, they are undesirable difficulties. And that's going back to my sort of first slide, which is we've got to get people up to the level where these challenges are realistic and fair. Um, otherwise, these things are very undesirable difficulties. Um, so that was my first thing, that sort of challenges to ability. So I'm just sort of playing with, with um, some of the things that the research is showing us that we could use in our teaching to help students to learn more and to stretch their abilities. And it's incredibly hard, I think, for us as teachers because there's so much research out there. Uh, but I think there's a, the challenge to us is that we should be looking for the research and, and the challenge to the university is that the university, when it does learning and teaching, shouldn't just do, here's a nice little tip for the classroom. It should be, here's the underlying research which says that this tip actually leads to some sort of change in learning. <laughs> Um, and, and for us to test our own innovations, to make sure that our innovations actually actually lead to the results that we assume they lead to. Okay, here's my second um, far side slide. Um, why can't we all be sheep? Um, we don't have to be sheep. So, and this is, I think, you know, this is what separates universities. Um, I hate I hate PowerPoint because I have to say things in the order that the PowerPoint's coming in, and that and I was about to just say something. It's a slide ahead, so I have to stop. So that's, you know, PowerPoint is evil, but we know that. Um, uh, the best education should make students aware and respect. Uh, I, this is just, there's more than this, but these are three that occurred to me as really important. Diversity, you have to get outside of your own worldviews. You have to confront distressing um, issues. Even things that are really emotionally distressing for people, this is what university is for. This is the only safe place to really talk about these things. Um, and you've got to be exposed to competing ideologies and that raises some interesting ideas that are three slides away. Um, but you have to build 
you have to build critical literacy in the students. So it's not just about technological literacy and workplace literacy and professionalism. We've got to teach our students to have the tools to understand what being critical is and how to be critical about things. Um, and that requires us to understand what being critical is and that not, I'm not sure that we always remember or understand. So here's sort of what's left of what was going to be a whole part of the, um, the, the, the talk. So you know, what are we here for? What's the point? Um, I don't think that we are here as a university to be training employees. I'm not even sure we should be training professionals in a workplace understanding of what a professional is. Um, and we certainly shouldn't be engaging in what um, Farrow called the banking model of education where we just dump information into people and they just take it and leave. So university has to be about something bigger than that because the private providers can do all of that and they can do it faster, cheaper, more efficient. Um, there's a German term called Bildung. Um, which has contested meanings and you know, that's a whole discussion in itself. But if I can be allowed to just sort of refer to it and move on. Um, it's this idea that you're, you're building, a, you're creating a better person. The person becomes better as a result of being here, that their mind is open to broader perspectives, they develop reflection and, and so forth. Um, and there's a quote here from the article by Beck about, uh, about building, that students undergo substantial changes as you're learning the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, the goals and the stances and, um, about professions and, and that societies need. And you engage in a lifelong process, and this is the, I think the key thing, that asks you to put yourselves in relation to your knowledge and your beliefs, your ability to get outside of your own beliefs and critique them and not just assume that they're right. Um, and this idea of understanding of professionalism and civic responsibility, that it's more than just a, a certification that allows you to push the button. It's about understanding what that button's for and why, if you push it, bad things could happen. Um, so here's, here's a couple of provocations about pedagogy, because I, I actually think that pedagogy, pedagogy is inherently ideological. I don't think you can go into a room to teach without an ideology. And you need to be aware of what your ideology is, and you have to also, I think, be aware that your ideology is not necessarily the ideology of your students, but that the students have to come into terms with that and you've got to also be able to, um, as the last quote said, step away from your own ideology and your own stances. So here's some, some provocations. Um, if there is a dominant ideology, does this mean good teaching should emphasise the alternatives? So if we all know that everybody is going out to work hard, to build a house, have, have three kids and to contribute to the sort of the neoliberal notion of modern society, should we as educators be actually saying, hang on, there are other ways to do this. This is the time in your life where you slow down that process and actually think about other ways to do it. You don't have to accept it, but you have to take it seriously so that then you can make a considered choice about the ideology that you actually want to um, to accept. And that's a really significant thing. I mean, you see in the US the way in which the politics outside the university tries to shut the university down and to make the university do what the dominant ideology is doing. Um, and if there is um, hegemony in that sort of um, um, Gramsci, um, Marx, um, sort of a Marxian notion of uh, a form of power which is you are unaware of and yet you accept and you help to support, is it our job to actually to illuminate those sorts of things and to say, you know that uh, actually you think this is the thing you should be doing, but in fact if you do that, you realise there will be these implications and you really want to do it. Um, and um, the other sort of issues are, if, if that's the case, then do we, are we required to discuss with students points of views we don't agree with and we find um, awkward or, or difficult? Or can we just look to our, our colleagues to do that? So can we in the modern university where, where we have sort of controls over the way in which we teach, can we allow a degree of idiosyncrasy in our teachers so that our students as they go through a degree get the teacher they really like, get the teacher who they really hated, um, not on a quality level but on a sort of a, a perspective on subject level. Can we, can we actually encourage the students to recognise that they are supposed to be getting a bit of everything on their way through? So as I said, they're provocations. Um, but this one's not a provocation. I think we all need to be reflective practitioners. And Brookfield makes a, a really good point about the four lenses. So there's the lens, you can only understand what you're doing by looking at the four lenses. One is the lens of the student. How does the student see what you're doing? One is the lens of, um, of your experience. What is it that you actually think you're doing when you reflect on it? The third is the lens of your peers. 
how are your peers seeing your teaching when they come to see you teach? And the fourth one is theory. What does the theory say about your teaching? If you take those four lenses into account, then you can sort of get a better sense of, of what you're doing. Okay, so all of this is, is, is fantastic. Um, but um, online, there is no Chatham House. So Chatham House being that notion that in the room, this is private, we won't repeat outside the room what we said to each other. And we'll be honest and we'll be safe. So online, um, Um, online, you can't do these things. You can't, you can't gauge the student mix in a classroom, um, particularly at the beginning of semester. You don't know who these people are. Um, you, their name won't tell you. Their, um, their photo won't tell you. Um, their profile probably won't tell you. You won't feel the emotion, what, who, who's confident, who's not confident. So you need to really see people. You need to be in a room in order to understand what the dynamic of a classroom is. Um, and you can't easily stop um, inappropriate discussion, which you can in a room. Somebody says something that's really wrong, you can just say, that's inappropriate, you know, stop. And you, can, um, and you can support a student who's been attacked immediately. Whereas you, online, there's a lag. You, uh, you're not going to be online 24 hours a day waiting for the 3 a.m. post where somebody flames somebody else. So you, you have these sort of issues. Um, and you can push a discussion where you want to go really quickly. So if somebody says something, you say, that's really, a really interesting point, but there's something in there that you didn't mention, which was this, what do the rest of you think? So you can redirect discussion instantly to get it back to where you need it to go. And, and the, the nicest thing I think about a, a room discussion is when someone says something really insightful or, or really powerful, for the rest of the class, the, the rest of the students to be able to say, you know, even just by sort of smiling or body language, just give that instant feedback that that was really good. And, and for the student to then instantly feel that they've actually made a sig significant contribution, which, what, smiley faces, emojis, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you do that online. I mean, that's what emojis are, aren't they? They're an attempt to overcome the lack of emotion online. But having said that, no, this is dead, um, there are huge advantages to online discussions as well, and they are that you can overcome power imbalances. The really loud person can't type any faster than the really quiet person. Um, you can give people time to think about a question. You can give them a day, you can give them a week, you can give them all semester to come up with a response. And you can expand, expand class time so everyone gets a go. So it's not to say online, it doesn't help to challenge people's worldviews. Um, but when we're looking at those sort of difficult uh, processes of actually trying to get people to really reflect and think about themselves, face-to-face -face has huge advantages and online has advantages as well. And we just need to be very careful as teachers, and this is the challenge for teachers, to work out When's it appropriate? Which topics should you do face-to-face? -face? Which topics um, work best online? Is it good to start, for example, a topic face-to-face -face and then allow continuation online? Or, does, or has that meant that the loud voices have already dominated the, quest, the, the question so much that there's nothing to say online? So, you know, it's, and every class is different, and that's part of the, the, the huge challenge and the, the hardness of teaching, is that you are constantly having to monitor that and really trying to sort of work that through. Um, and um, the challenges of emotion in teaching. Um, this, is, uh, this is emotion in learning. This is the sort of the third thing I wanted to talk about. There are huge emotions that, that people face as they're learning. This is not outside of the learning process, but as part of the learning process. Um, there are many students who are the first time they've ever come to university. There are students who come from incredibly poor, or disadvantaged, or marginalised communities. Um, there are students who are themselves, you know, rediscovering who they are, and that can be incredibly difficult to when they're when they're trying to confront their own worldviews and they're trying to confront the worldviews of other people, or they're trying to learn. They need to be supported. They need a safe environment. So we need, when we're teaching, to recognise that there's a huge amount of that sort of emotion. There's also imposter syndrome, which of course I've overcome by giving this talk, but this idea that, that we all quite rationally have that we really don't know what we're talking about. Um, the people who don't have imposter syndrome are really the overconfident ones. So we have to recognise that all of the students um, think, I'm not really sure this is right. So we have to sort of give them affirmations when they're, when they're getting close to the mark and, and not be too hard on them when, when they're missing. Um, there's a huge amount of emotional triggers, trigger warnings, that's a whole other talk. But um, I think my, my simple thing is they're hidden in every single class. Um, you don't know what happened to someone in their life. 
Um, you know, sexual assault and racism are the sort of two most obvious ones to us because they're in the media. But anything, anything could have happened in someone's life, um, something could have happened to someone they love, which just happens to be the thing that you're talking about in class. And it, you know, it may to you be just a good example for a comedic moment, and you don't know. So, so we just always have to watch our students to try to, to not do that. But at the same time, um, I don't think we can shy away from dealing with the actual really difficult issues. This is the, as I said before, it's the only safe place probably in their life. It's safer than their family, it's safer than their workplace, it's probably safer than their friends for them to explore ideas and to think about things. And so we have to go to the hard places, but we have to always be very, very careful that when we go to the hard places, if somebody has been sort of triggered by something, they are not in a learning situation anymore, they're in a survival situation. So you have to make sure that there are ways for people to, to easily escape these conversations. So you, you tell them they're coming if you know it's likely to, to be triggering and you, you sort of say to students at the beginning of semester, walk out any time, I, I don't need to know why, it's entirely, you know, you're an adult, uh, I, don't, I don't need to private, it's your private life. So give people space to come in and go out. Um, and then there's um, dealing with the attitudes of others. So if you want people to engage and, and question their own worldviews, and then their, their worldviews are going to be questioned too. So we, we have to frame conversations. We have to say, you know, well, you, know, you don't think that's a racist thing to say, but actually a lot of other people do. So I'm not judging you about your attitude, but I'm just saying in this class, if you could not say it that way, that's part of your experience of how to frame your views in a way that doesn't offend other people. Um, um, and there are um, anxieties of expectations. You know, so many students here are here because you know their, their parents are pushing them, or they themselves are pushing themselves. And so we we have to make sure that we, we value expectation on its own terms, rather uh, you know, achievement on its own terms, rather than um, sort of external things. But then there's really good things. There's lots of really good things. I mean, that's why people come to uni. It's exciting, and there's this euphoria that students have. Um, and that I think we have sometimes when we teach about, you know, we're going to learn something today. This is new, this is exciting, this is, this is not like working at McDonald's. This is, there's something really big going on here. And so the more we can support that and encourage that, when someone, you see someone learn something to say, you know, what was it? You know, get them to tell us that, that kind of stuff is, is awesome. And, um, and also the pleasures of transgressive learning is also something to not underestimate. The fact that your family might have told you the world was a particular way, or you might have yourself believed the world was a particular way, and then to discover something that's very, very wrong according to that, but yet is very intellectually interesting. That, and then, uh, the other thing, I mean, one of the sort of the things I, I learned from, you know, uh, from sort of long experience um, of mistakes was that I could never convince somebody of anything. Um, I mean, I, I think we all know this if we've got teenagers. You, you cannot convince somebody of something in an argument. What you can do is you can put the position in an argument and then you can leave them and see what happens later. And I think in our classes, particularly as we get shorter and shorter and shorter with trimesters, you're never going to change anyone's mind in nine weeks or ten weeks. But you are going to give them the information and the perspective so that they can make their mind up later, a year or two down the track, hopefully. If they've remembered, of course, if you've done the testing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so there's emotional burdens of teaching as well. And, and these are really important for us to, to recognise. And this is why, what makes teaching so hard. Teaching is not about going in and just dumping information. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting argument that the people who are experts at research are not experts at teaching um, in the same way because what, what a researcher does is a researcher um, finds new novel um, ideas um, or, or phenomena and then can write them in a form that other experts can understand. But what a teacher does is a teacher has to have the ability to also understand all of that, but then also translate it from an expert audience to a novice audience. So that's an extra skill that the teacher needs on top of the researcher. So you need to be able to read research and then translate it. So you are a translator, and that is, that, that's a lot of work. And it's a performance. You, you, your affect, the way you talk to people, engages them or disengages them. I mean, we all know. Um, and you're also constantly judged. This is not something where you write a paper and send it off and see what happens. Um, the peer reviews can be sometimes really horrible, but you know, the, 
they're in emails and you read them at night and you cry and then no one sees. Um, if you have someone in class tells you, no, that's wrong, I've, I've got it here on Google, you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's a straight there. Um, and so you have to be able to deal with that. You are constantly putting yourself out on the line. You're saying, I think I know this. And um, if you've got bright students, they're probably going to know more than you. Um, but at the same time, when you get it right and you can see the little light bulbs going on in people's heads, that's an enormous feedback. That's sort of one of the greater loves of teaching. Um, and you need to make yourself vulnerable as a result. Um, and um, you need to be able to build a trusting and safe learning environment. And look, there are really significant gender and status issues here. Um, it's very easy for me to, um, as I did last semester, teach a class entirely wrong and then send the students an email saying, sorry, I got that wrong. And then to discover in my, sort of my experience response, the students saying the best thing about that course was the day you got it wrong and you, you admitted you got it wrong. Now th that's easy for me because I'm male and I'm a professor. It's incredibly hard for someone who's an associate professor and a female who speaks English as a th second or third language. So, so vulnerability is something we aspire for all of our staff to have, but it's really, really hard for some people to be vulnerable and still be respected. So, and I think that's something as a university, you know, in terms of educating students about what to expect of people um, is really important. But if you can show that vulnerability and that fallibility, then that also enormously builds engagement and the students are there with you because you're not there telling them you're part of a, a learning community. Um, and um, this is a great, um, great quote from, from Mary Heath. Um, about the emotional labour that, that teachers are expected. Um, so apart from the learning, you're, you're expected to build rapport between students and to exercise tact in providing effective constructive feedback, deal with inappropriate and confrontational in-class interactions, manage the delivery of um, sensitive and challenging material, encourage confidence, persistence and resilience in students. Um, not to mention all the timetabling issues and everything went wrong and all of that kind of stuff and the fact that we're going through massive change in the university and all of that. And then at the same time, you're also supposed to take care of your own professional and, and well-being. And that's a massive burden that, that, that teachers face. Um, but, um, so what do we do with it? Um, so obviously we're heroes, and we can pat ourselves on the back about it, um, but why do we do it? And look, um, this is one of the sort of silliest things I did. Um, last night I was trying to find an inspirational quote, and they were all really naff, so I made my own up. Um, <laughs> So I have my own NAF quote, which I'll be embarrassed about, the fact that I've put it up there. But I have put it in very clear font, in lots of white, <laughs> so you will assume that it's true, right? Um, but I just think that, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but there is the potential that you're changing a life every time you're dealing with a student. There was one quote I saw that I didn't put in, which was that um, um, most people are only uh, remembered by six people in their lives, but a teacher is remembered by thousands. Um, that, that same sort of idea. Uh, but then again, so is Donald Trump, so I'm not, I'm not sure. That, um, but, and, and as a student, I think too, it's really important, this isn't just about teaching, this is, this is about students and, and, the, uh, the, um, and learning. That every time you go into a classroom, or every time you read something for class or, or do an activity, for, um, there is a chance to discover something new, something important, something that might change your life and something that might make you a better person. And hopefully that's, that's why we're all here. Thanks. So thanks for, is this one on? Yes, okay, thanks very much, Alex, for that. Um, you've given us a very thoughtful, a very provocative um, presentation. The thing that really struck me actually from your presentation is actually your deep understanding of uh, students and actually your deep affinity with students as well. I think that came across quite strongly. I did like your comment though right at the beginning about it's becoming harder for our current students because I started writing it down and I saw the extended concentration on one task was going to be difficult so I just went on to the next thing that I had to do. Um, reading complex text, as you saw I didn't bother reading all of that thing you put up there from Bob Dylan. The first thing I did was just take out one line out of that, googled it, found it was Bob Dylan and then I read a critique that someone else did of Bob Dylan's um, uh, song and I thought that's what I'd just put in my essay if I was actually going to give it to you. Um, and then extended writing, well sorry, I just did 140 characters for my yeah, tweets on here, so that's fine. But they've extended uh, it, haven't they, on Twitter? It, they they might. I'm, I'm yeah. still only doing 140 though. I can't do more than that. Um, so look, we're going to open it up for questions and comments now, so I'm going to hand the mic over to others. So please, yep, yeah, we've got one. 
Um, can I just press you on that, the comments that you made towards the end um, about ego? I think there was a, there was a slide um, about ego and one about vulnerability. So I think I agree with you, um, especially the points you made about um, getting it wrong <laughs> and the importance of getting it wrong, um, which I would kind of call teaching without authority, displacing the authority of the teacher, which then creates a space for them to get it right, or, get, or them perhaps even better to get it wrong as well. Um, but it doesn't follow for me that the would be involved in that process some kind of withdrawing of ego or displacing your views, whether they're ideological or political or what have you. And I think that cuts against what you were saying earlier. For me, the better teaching style of teaching is one that consistently gets it wrong, but gets it wrong in an open way that mm. then encourages the students to disagree with you. Would you agree with that or not? Yeah, yeah no, I completely agree with that. I, I, I think what I was getting at with the ego was that it's not about being a rock star. Yeah. It's not, about, it's not about you, it's actually about the students. I mean, in fact, you know, the, the, the ideal is that where you, know, you go in and the students tell you everything that they've learnt and you write it all down and that's amazing, which oh, never happens. But you know, that's what you're aiming for, so you're trying to diminish your role, but of course you can't because you've taught that course for 20 times, so you actually know exactly what it is you want to get, so you are going to get there. So the, the biggest thing is to pull yourself back and to almost pretend that you don't know what you're doing so that the students can work it out themselves. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is James Lee. I'm visiting the law faculty from King's College London. Um, one of the ways in which I found your fascinating lecture challenging uh, is when it comes to accessibility for students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the ways in which my teaching has evolved over uh, recent years is in thinking about the best practice of what I I and we do generally for all students and how that can be supportive. Um, for example, the use of fonts and the use of clear uh, backgrounds and so on. But from what you were saying, it sounds like the evidence in terms of general learning styles for students suggests that we shouldn't be doing some of those formats of delivery that inclusion plans or, or whatever support agreements are called say have to be done mm. for students. And so that, that is mm. a tension uh, potentially if we're to support students, whether it's visual impairments or, or learning um, uh, difficulties and so on. So uh, how do we square that problem? Yeah, look, I, as I said, it's, what I was doing is a bit of a parlor trick. I mean, the, the, the studies in the labs use font as a way of proving it, but I think in the real sort of teaching environment, font is so probably a bit neither here nor there, although it's, it's, a, it's an easy way into the idea of how easy are you making it for the students. But I would have, I would have thought for students with disabilities, there's so much disfluency to start with that the easier you make it for them, the, the, the more you make it a desirable difficulty rather than an undesirable difficulty. But I think, uh, I think your, your points are really good and if we're doing that for the students who have disabilities, are we actually sort of shortchanging the, the, the students without the disabilities by making it all a bit too accessible for them? But you know, that, I think that they're the constant sort of issues that you have to deal with. I mean, if, if you're giving somebody a very long, complex piece of text, then you don't need to make the font difficult. It's hard enough as it is. So I, I think you can, make, you can put the challenge in other places. Yeah. Thank you. Um, these are, all, found that these are all questions from law so far. <laughs> I found that fascinating, but one of the things I noticed was I, I don't think you talked about the attitude that the student begins with mm. and how you manage their expectations. So if you're going mm. to use techniques like disfluency or, or things like that, um, are there ways, do you think, of managing their managing their expectations so that they come in with an attitude of this is a challenge I'm going to reach for rather than oh this is hard and I don't want to do it. So do you yeah. have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, 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 can, I, I agree. I, and I think that's the framing part of it. So you've got to say to the, you're saying to the students, well, what do you want to get out of this? Do you want to learn to be able to read harder things? Do you want to be able to increase your levels of concentration? If you do, print it out, find a quiet space, um, and, and really think about it and reflect on it as you go. If, if you just want a, a pass and you don't really care, then you know, I'm not here for you. Um, but yeah, but I think that's right. It, and it, that comes back to the really, the sort of the, the broader question of what's the point of a university? Is a university about the conveyor belt that gets you through incredibly efficiently in under two years to your credential so you can go out and make money? Or is it, or is it a process which almost is designed to be hard um, I mean, the interesting thing is if you do stuff online, you can do it whenever you want. 
want, you can be interrupted all the time, you know, it's, but if, you, if you're told, okay, to pass this course, you must attend, you have, you have an attendance requirement, you must come to this class twice a week for 12 weeks, and if you don't, you won't pass. Then you're making it difficult in terms of their work-life balance or their life, uh, their study leisure balance or study casual work balance or whatever it is, but you're actually creating a space in their life where the only thing they're supposed to be doing is learning. And that's, you can increase the difficulty that way by actually setting the expectations. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Madeline Gleeson, also from the Law Faculty. We were encouraged to come and give you a hard time. <laughs> it's, the, it's the clack. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, from your research, if you had any lessons that would be directly applicable as we move towards the trimesters and are trying to work out what <laughs> of our content or what of our assessment or you know what parts should be moved online versus which ones are better in the classroom. Was there any sort of general lessons to be learnt about which one's more effective in one medium versus the other to help us make the cuts? No, no, no. Okay. no. I, I, all, all I found were more problems, yeah. I mean, I, mean it, it, I, I think it, it depends on the class, it depends on the way you teach, it depends on the students. Um, and I suppose we just try things and, and see what works. I mean, I, I mean, the trimester is a massive social experiment, isn't it, really? Um, uh, as all big changes are. Um, and, you know, we'll... If, if the interesting thing is whether or not we can work out whether we've got baselines now that we can then compare to after the change. Um, and, and the interesting thing is we probably don't have baselines now because we've never really tried to work out what's actually going on in student learning. So, so it will be a change that we'll just have to wing, I suppose. But um, yeah, I, I, and I, think it, it, I think it's different for disciplines. I think it's different for classes even in disciplines. Um, you know, the, the, and, and also stages. So, you know, first years, I, I would guess you really want them in the classroom. You really want to, to do the sort of stuff that Prue was saying about setting the expectations, explaining why it's hard, getting them to accept the challenges. And then that means that, you know, in later years when they are sort of working part-time or, or doing things like that, they've already absorbed those lessons of what the challenges and why the challenges are there and they're hopefully creating their own adult learning environment so that you can make more of it online. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not from law. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm a learning technologist from uh, Denmark and Scandinavia. This is halfway a comment on your question and halfway a comment on uh, some of your, um, what, what you said. Um, when you talked about the emotional strains and the emotional outcomes of learning, um, <clears throat> I think you missed one good point. Uh, the huge innate pleasure that comes from cracking a nut that you didn't mm. think you can crack. And that's yeah, exactly yeah, where yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. where all the, um, oh, I forget words. Um, <clears throat> where it comes from when you uh, try to get the students to, to actually learn. Show them that pleasure, show them how you, uh, when you crack that nut, oh, that's so good. Yeah, and, and so you've got to sort of, in, in the early years, make sure the nuts are easier to crack. And so, and, and I think the really hard thing about this is that you've got to work out that desirable difficulty thing. When is the difficulty enough to inspire and not enough to discourage? And that's incredibly hard, and that's why teaching is so hard, I suppose. Um, Alex, <coughs> I'm not from law either, as you know. No. Um, so we've started a trend. Um, <laughs> I, I guess well, they always get in first, don't they? <laughs> and and, and the, my question actually probably reflects the fact that, that I'm, I'm not from law, uh, which is, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, learning disabilities, social disadvantage and so on, and, and that's all, all really important. But I guess um, in the humanities and social sciences where I come from, of course, as a matter of routine, we have a students a bunch of students, apart from all of those things, who have very widely divergent educational mm. backgrounds and levels of attainment, all the way from the students who are doing combined arts law, who generally mm. are very well equipped for university, and right down to a whole lot who, who have just scraped into the arts ATAR, and, and I know that ATAR is a poor indicator, but nonetheless yeah, they're yeah, generally yeah, struggling. Yeah, yeah. Now, keeping Finding the point where and and the capacity to 
to use your expression, present all of those students with desirable difficulty mm. rather than undesirable mm. difficulty mm. is an enormous challenge. Have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, yeah uh, that, that's the, 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 the big sort of elephant in the room, really, isn't it? That, that, um, as we, uh, and, and it's part of that first thing about what's the point of higher education? Because as we've massified education, we've increased um, the ability of, of students um, of a whole range to come in, but yet we still teach courses which have the same out exit standard. So either there's, a, there's, a, there's I think probably two solutions. Um, in an, I mean, the ideal world is you've got your Oxford tutor and someone gets you through. But um, either we put a huge amount of um, effort into supporting students to get up to the le up to a common level, which is I think probably the right answer. Um, and the other one is to actually have tiers of, of achievement within courses, which I think is completely the wrong answer. But probably the other wrong answer is to have students of lots of different levels of ability all in the one class, all desperately trying to sort of <coughs> achieve to the same level. Um, yeah, and I, I think that is, that is the real, one of the real issues, that you need a challenge for a student that's achievable for them to really um, um, succeed, not the word, but really sort of fly and, and, and really sort of overachieve. But if you've got a large range of abilities in the class, how, yeah, how do you do it? And it's, yeah. So I loved your <laughs> talk because it reminded me of all the things that I wish a university were. I mean, you've basically given us a Socratic yeah. uh, ideal and you've overlaid it with actually a tradition of sort of Christian values of every individual uh, I'm okay, you're okay, treat others, be respectful to the community. And those are the two great values in our society and the love of learning. And I also like the transgressive pleasure because I think that's seldom talked about. But what I worry is that much as I love that model, the reality is that much as we love critical thinking and those pleasures, I'm not sure that our student body is paying the fees they have for a JD degree because of a desire to develop critical thinking. Yeah, yeah and that, well, that's why I disagree, actually. So that's why they came here rather than to the other JD degrees. So, and and that, I think that's the distinctiveness of the university, the ability to say, you can go and get the degree and you can go off and make money anywhere you want, but if you come here, it will be harder. But you, and you'll have to think, and we won't give you that degree unless you're a really critical thinker. And, and that's our distinctiveness. But I mean, I'm, that's hard in the business so, environment. As I said at the beginning, I have to think about the things you say, so I'll reflect about that for a couple of years. I hope that all the students, all the students are paying their fees here because of the distinctive critical thinking we offer them. Hi, my name is Sandra, and I teach English to adults. So in the context of English as a second language learning, we do something called genre-paced pedagogy, which means explaining the stages of a text to the students. For example, yep. the introduction, the dot point argument, and the conclusion. And I found in my career as a university student that sometimes the best students don't need to be taught in genre or they are more flexible with genre. So I'd like to know what it is that really amazes the teachers here. I'd like to know what it is you really want to foster in your students and how you define that intelligence, particularly across disciplines. Mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's just, it's why I came tonight. Yeah, yeah that's right, a couple of easy questions there. I mean, I completely, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned the sort of the, the genre training for, for reading. I mean, that's something I've done some research into and I think it's a real issue that we have, particularly particularly in law. The students don't understand what they're looking at. Um, and that's the very, very bright student. So if, if your English is a second language, it's even worse. You, so there, are, there, is a, there is a need for people to actually understand, to understand structures of, of text in the same way you, you understand any sort of phenomenon in, in life. Um, and, you know, it just, yeah. But how much do you do and when do you do it and, yeah. All right, thank you. Mm. Uh, Alex, there's a question I might have for you, if that's okay. Um, one of the things I noticed when you were uh, describing online, you seem to be describing asynchronous online rather than synchronous mm, online. Yes, yes. And you didn't really make it, I didn't, yes, it didn't appear to yes, me you made a yes. distinction between the two. Yes. And I think it's one of the things that often many people think as well when they talk about online, they're automatically thinking asynchronous. Mm. But we've been trying to promote an approach which is actually more along the lines of synchronous online mm. as well as the asynchronous online. And many of the things that you discussed 
I would posit you can do, right down to the emotional bits, right mm. down to the mm. safe environments, right down to the teacher being able to direct and do all those sorts of things as well, in a synchronous online environment. It does give you, it is a different way of doing it, but yeah, yeah. I would have thought you could do all of that in a synchronous way. Yeah, I, 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 I think you can do, I'd say you can do most of it in a synchronous environment because it's a flat screen. It's not, um, and, the, and the way in which the camera is directed at the person um, or not directed at the person sort of also frames the way in which things are seen. But yes, it's a huge advance on asynchronous, um, but the difficulty is where's the technology for it that this university's got or any university's got really um, that doesn't fall over five minutes in or five minutes before. Um, you know, we, we, we can't really even, um, within, within the staff, we can't have staff meetings or committee meetings um, online where people dial in from a remotely because the university isn't set up for it. And we've tried to set it up and it never quite works because the mics are wrong or the cameras drop out. So it's a dream and I, I agree with you. If we get to that, then that will actually solve most of these issues, but I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. Uh, perhaps one more question, I think, over here. Yep. Hi, Alex. Um, thank you very much for that lecture. Um, Super glad I came now. Um, as a student and a new sessional lecturer, lecturer, I found everything that you said extremely relevant and applicable. And my question is probably more of a, a practical one as I prepare to uh, deliver my first lecture next week. Um, no, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. So, but I'm I'm very self-conscious uh, about going into these lectures. Um, falling into the old traps about like what you were saying of just dumping information on students and, and failing to engage students so it just becomes a process that they have to turn up to each week and I'm just wondering do you have any sort of recommended strategies for how often that engagement should occur like is it minimum once every lecture or do it a couple of times a lecture to keep them involved with that process on a weekly basis? Yeah, um, so my sort of first sort of bit of advice would be um, that um, this is my, this is just my experience, um, that it was only the third time I taught something that I felt I was teaching it. So the first time was an oral exam where I had to tell the students everything I'd learnt to prove that I wasn't a fraud. The second time was a bit better but it was still pretty sort of, but it was only about the third time that I felt comfortable enough to pro not properly prepare. And it was when I hadn't quite properly prepared that I'd left behind all that insane detail that I had to cram down their throats and we had a bit of room to talk. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's, that might, might be the experience. Um, lectures, are, yeah, uh, lectures are hard to get engagement. Um, it's a year since I did one, um, so I'm the, the least qualified person here probably to do it. But um, you, you, yeah, um, you, can, you can do things like um, you know, put sort of quick polls, people can put their hands up, you can ask them questions about things they don't think the lecture is going to be about. You can start the lecture with a quiz. You can um, you know, ask people randomly sort of three quarters of the way through, okay, what, you know, what did I say about this? Put your hand up if it was this or that. So you can do sort of mini testing all the way through. Um, doesn't have to take time. Um, if you really feel brave, you can do a pub quiz, you know, where it's a trivia and you stand up or you sit down until there's one person who's a winner. Um, but you have to be really brave to do that. So I, I, I just go baby steps. I just get, I'd survive the first lecture and probably survive the first semester and then, yeah. <laughs> And, um, sorry, is it, what works. Yeah. and sorry, is it possible to get that PowerPoint slide just yeah. for my own reference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah Thank you. No worries. Yeah. Okay, we might uh, continue the questions over some refreshments uh, after this, so you're welcome to stay and continue the conversation. Let's just all thank Alex for what I think has been a very thoughtful and a very deep conversation. <laughs>